This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, recording Harry Potter style in a closet under the stairs. Today, you thought house training a Labradoodle was tough. Let's check out the Mulu. All right, let's go. Hi, everyone. One of my gigs is as a faculty advisor for the Victoria Stowell Dog Trainer Academy. It's a pretty good gig where I get to help people who want to be dog trainers build a foundation of learning theory and technique and skill, and they get to learn all the necessary things to run a successful dog training business. It's a lot of work for the students, and it's a lot of fun for everyone, myself included. I frequently talk with my students about how every animal essentially learns the exact same way, through reinforcement and punishment. If you put your hand on a hot stove, well, you learned an important lesson, didn't you? Mainly, don't do that again. Get something good for doing a task, even if it's not something you prefer to do, like a paycheck for work that you don't love, or a candy for being good at the grocery store. I'm speaking from personal experience. (laughs) And that's going to be an important thing to keep in the back of your mind today when we discuss how scientists, or rather, why scientists are potty training cows like they're giant dogs to pee in a specific location. But before we get to what is coined the mulu, and I'm so mad I didn't come up with that, Big thanks go to Christy and Nicole. I'm sure both Christy and Nicole were super excited to hear that their names are bookending urinating cattle, but I mean, well, maybe they were hoping for it. They've heard the show before. (laughs) I have no idea. But they both started supporting Bewilder Beasts on Patreon this month. And as a special thanks to them and everyone who supports at any level, they get an extra story a month. And depending on what tier they support, they also get stickers, ask me any things that become shows, handwritten letters, begging a spouse, partner, parent, anyone, really, for permission to get an animal of their choosing. It's all for fun. So if you like it, there are episodes already for you to listen to on your way to school, work, the long weekend coming up, wherever. And to Christy and Nicole, mwah, you make my rockin' world go round. Which, if you've heard the last bonus episode, you'll get the joke. Every nail I put in the blankets around my little Harry Potter closet under the stairs is for you and all the trust that you put in me, so thank you. This week's story was brought to you by a fast fact on the show Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the NPR News Quiz. And from my husband who listens to the actual news every morning and knows exactly what I like. So with all of that said, let's get on with today's show, shall we? So my behavior caseload is filling up with people who happened to acquire puppies and dogs during the pandemic. Of course, we were all worried about the separation anxiety piece of it and going back to the office, school, etc. But there is another issue on everyone's mind when they bring in a new animal. House training. All those little puppies have to figure out that peeing inside is not ideal for the owners. Peeing outside is epic. House training is part of having a dog or a puppy live in the house, right? So let's take our lens and pull it back a little bit. Go a little more wide frame. What other animals can be taught to pee in a specific location? Well, cats, they have to be litter box trained. And I will say I have never had the pleasure of teaching a cat to pee in a box. My current cats came with that software uploaded thankfully. But have you ever seen a cow, like a cow cow, walk into the little calves room, close the door behind her, pee in a specific piece of cowy outhouse material? You haven't? Well, it's your lucky day. Ew. 
go to YouTube and look for Potty Training Cattle. I mean, you may have already looked this up before. The internet is a weird, weird place. You might have found some interesting things. It is YouTube. I'm not here to yuck anyone's yum. But this time, I promise, Pinkie Pie swear, that there is going to be a video of a young black and white cow pushing open a door like she's entering the OK Corral. Which, I mean, she is entering a corral that is OK for her to pee in, so it works for me. She then walks through a door into some astroturf, lifts her tail, pees like she's guzzled a big gulp on the highway, and hasn't seen a rest stop in a matter of hours. Then she turns to a motorized sound where a sweet treat is waiting for her. The NPR article that I read said that this was in many ways easier than training children. Y'all, this is not wrong. I have trained dogs, kids, and I have been currently working with an old lady cat. And the hoops that I had to go through for all of these were astronomical. This cow waltzes in, does the cow version of tinkle, tinkle, little star, gets a treat, and moseys out of the stall all cow-like. It's really quite spectacular. So who's ready to get real gross into the inner workings of why scientists are doing this? The answer, funny enough, actually started off as, well, can we? For fun? But the reasoning behind it is actually quite useful and maybe a little more serious. So let's backtrack for a minute into some environmental science. Who here has heard of acid rain? It's not great. I mean, it's not, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, pure acid pouring out of the sky. What it is is when rain mixes with chemicals and elements to make the rain, or snow, or dust, or hail, or anything coming from the sky really, more acidic than what is considered normal. Most rain should be balanced at about a 7 on a pH scale. That's halfway between the most acid and the most basic. Not the colloquial girls with Uggs, pumpkin spice everything, black leggings, fitted flannel, and soft cozy beanies. Basic like, well, milk. As in, not acidic. Snow is often a little more acidy than rain anyway at about a pH balance of 6. But when cars blow lots of exhaust, salt on the roads, the generation of electricity, all of that stuff contributes to acid rain. And it makes the good stuff that we need, like water coming from the sky, lean more acidic. And some of these things can't be helped. Like when a volcano goes boom, that's totally normal. Decaying vegetation. So pumpkin spice season where everything is dying, that is normal. But urban areas are a huge contributor of acid rain. Boston rush hour for sure is not helping and urbanization, industry, electricity generation, all of it just hurts. It's not great. But just because the chemistry magic that makes acid rain happen where volcanoes are or high traffic areas occur, burning of fossil fuels or all of the things that create sulfuric acid and nitric acid can carry for hundreds of miles, and that's where rains come. Those areas are also affected by acid rain. So when people talk about acid rain and its effects on lakes and rivers and woods and forests and animals and soil, they almost always point to New England and Canada. Wait. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> what? I'm in New England. Why is this the first I'm hearing about this? Ugh, I just bought a house. Great. But you know what else causes acid rain? You might be tempted to say cow farts, because we are talking about cows and everyone thinks of methane. Cow farts are hilarious. Scientists do spend a ton of time studying animals, and a subsection of those scientists are super into farts. I mean, reach for the stars, kids. Do something you love, and if you love fart humor, you can still do science as a grown-up. Because cows have four stomachs, there's a lot of methane that is released every time they burp, usually, or fart, occasionally. Methane is a gas that is linked to global warming or climate change, for sure. But it's not because cows are farting that our planet is getting too hot. Their farts have little to do with the topic of this story, but since we're here, the bigger issue is more the number of people who eat cows, cow products, drink milk, cheese, dairy, yes, even ice cream. And that necessitates all the land and space for raising cows to satisfy our needs. Those cows, in turn, fart, burp, pee, and poop. And you can't train them not to burp or fart, because then those cows would blow up. That's not ideal. So we have to do something else. 
We always think of methane with cows, but cow pee has a lot of nitrogen in it. And when it mixes with cow patties plopped on the ground, chemistry magic happens and it makes ammonia. That's a smell that you might know and love. It can burn your eyes. It's the pungent smell when your cat uses a litter box, the main get it done ingredient in many window cleaners and oven cleaners. Ammonia, when you're dealing with it on an individual cow who can produce up to eight gallons of pee per day, eight gallons. Think of filling the next eight milk jugs with pee. That is a cow product I do not want to purchase at the grocery store. And you multiply those eight gallons by one b -b 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 billion mooers, and now, Mooston, we have a problem. One billion cows being eight gallons of urine a day, mixing all that urine with poop. And I'm so glad I'm vegetarian. <laughs> Otherwise, I would just have to do all this math and I just don't want to. All right, fine. That's eight billion gallons of cow pee mixing with cow poop every day. You're welcome. Whoa! Those chemicals mix more like a gross version of making a DIY slime. Chemistry happens, gross gases go up into the sky, mix with water, and then comes down with the rain, snow, dust, and everything else that we've already talked about, and bam. That is the very quick and dirty of how acid rain occurs. And again, in small doses, this can be a very normal thing. But in large doses, 8 billion gallons of pee per day mixing with cow pies. They don't have that in the cute board game Chicka Pig, unless there is an expansion that I don't know about. Cows are responsible for half of the ammonia produced in all of Europe. Half. If there was a half-calf joke in here, I would make it. Ew. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Once the pee and poop mix in the unholy union in a cow field, microbes in the soil try to clean it up. That's their job. But instead, this process makes a ton of nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas. Remember the penguins from episode 2 who pooped so much nitrous oxide it made scientists go a little bit loopy in Antarctica? It's like that, but with the uncute business end of a cow. And we don't get the benefit. No one is going into a cow pasture for kicks, but it is important to note that the side effect is nitrous oxide, and that side effect is responsible for 7% of all the greenhouse gases that are tied to climate change in just the United States. So, on a lark, scientists, under time constraints, and that is important to note, decided that they would give cows a diuretic, something that would make them just pee a whole lot. But then they put the cows in a special pen, much like when a parent or guardian thinks a toddler's going to go pee everywhere. The kiddos put on a magic potty, and as soon as you hear that magic sound like a small fire hose indicating a success, a reward is given. In my kid's case, it was an owl sticker. In the case of a cow, a lick of molasses. Then, if the cows walked back to the mulu to pee later, they got more molasses. Pretty easy, right? But they also squirted the cows with cold water if they peed outside the pen, which is unnecessary. The scientists may have done this, again, like I was suggesting for time constraints, potentially to make the learning go faster, which when using punishers like this can actually backfire, as I've discussed before. If I squirted my kiddo with a hose every time she peed her pants while potty training, there would be many reasons that that would have backfired. For starters, our deductible for psychotherapy for her would be absolutely one of them. But the point of this isn't how learning works. I can talk about that piece all day long, but instead, these scientists were able to successfully train 11 cows to pee in a specific pen, which would separate the urine and the fecal matter. That's the poop. And the hope is that with 8 billion gallons of urine every single day, the experiment might be able to scale up, meaning... They could use what they learned here and separate these functions for cows so they don't mix in the field, which would produce laughing gas and contribute to acid rain, while not teaching them to hold it. Again, blowing up cows is very, very bad. My only question, though, is who draws the short straw and has to clean up eight gallons of cow urine per day? Not it. So what are some things that you can do at home today? Well, if you have cows, Get to training. See if you can potty train your cows at home. If you do not have cows, there's some very easy things that you can do. You can limit your intake of animal products and byproducts. 
you can choose to support local farms that have many smaller pastures instead of giant factory farms, meat-free Mondays, which is a very popular idea in America where people will choose not to have dinners, lunches, and breakfasts that are reliant on meat. So there are many things that you can do that are going to maybe not make you completely vegetarian if that's not something you're interested in. But vegetarianism is a choice, and I choose every day to be a vegetarian, though I do still drink milk, and I do still eat a lot of ice cream and so much cheese. So you can pick and choose what you would like, and maybe you can help contribute to lessening our dependency on these giant factory farms that are the biggest contributor to these eight billion (laughs) gallons, which is so gross, of cow urine per day in the world. And that can actually make a significant impact. Choose local, help support small farms, and if you have a cow, try to train it. So thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or other scientists that are interested in animal butts, please send it in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet up Bewildered Pod, Bewilder Beast Pod on Facebook, and Bewilder Beasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mutt Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from usgs.gov. That's the United States Geological Survey, theguardian.com, npr.org, the Chicka Pig board game, which if you haven't played it, it's super cute for kids under the age of 10, and beefmarketcentral.com on cattle inventory. (laughs) And if you want to watch a cow open a door, go pee, a lot of pee, then get a treat, you can go to youtube.com. The Telegraph has a great short video on this subject. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz. Interstitial music is by MK2. Additional music is provided by Pixabay and Freesound.org. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next week.